Emulsion Podcast. What is up, folks? My guest today is Brandon Dearden. He's the chef and content creator who runs the brand on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube called Chef Authorized. Super huge shout out to Adam Witt, who has also been on the show before, and he connected Brandon and I on Instagram, which ultimately made it possible for this interview to exist. And if you like my conversation with Brandon, I highly recommend you check out my conversation with Adam Witt because we talk a lot of, about a lot of similar topics, getting experience and then bringing those talents online to create content. And this is huge for young chefs who want to start to create content online. If at any point you'd like to pause, check out Chef Authorized online or any of the specific linkable things that we discussed, please do check out the show notes, which are always available in the description of this podcast or on the podcast website in the show notes section. And speaking of this podcast, I have a quick favor to ask. So Spotify just made ratings available in the app for all podcasts, and it would mean the world to me if you would give the show a rating. So if you get value from this content, if the podcast has helped you in any way, a free way to give back is to give us a rating either on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. And if you do it, if you leave a review, if you give us a five-star rating, even if it's a four-star rating, please share a screenshot with me on Instagram, and I will post that in my story just to say thanks. So again, thanks so much for being with me. Let's get into the conversation. A couple quick messages from our sponsors, and we will get right into the interview. From cone row grills to two-sided sharpening stones, and I was actually just browsing their magnificent, right now, sales section with something like 45% off, some really beautiful Japanese bowls and plates. Corin is such a wealth of high-quality Japanese gear for chefs. If you want to check the link in the description of this podcast for new knives, if you want to upgrade your current kit or anything that you're looking for food-wise that might fall into the handcrafted, high-quality, uh, and surprisingly consistent and affordable prices, too, on a lot of their products, I would really, really suggest you check out Corin. The link is in the description, or you can always check out justincana.com slash Corin. Did you know that you can get diners to discover, to book, and to return to your restaurant all in one place? Yelp for Restaurants is leveling the playing field for all businesses on the platform with some pretty new and powerful tools, and I was really shocked to see what Yelp is doing. There are, believe it or not, several restaurants here in Seattle that I've had the pleasure of eating at that use Yelp for Restaurants, and it's so easy for me as a guest to put myself on a wait list, even if it's super busy, and then I just get a text when my table is ready, and that's super, super valuable as a user experience. And for business owners, this means bigger reach, this means tools for your front of house, and this means a much higher likelihood that guests will actually come back, especially if they're willing to create a profile, because you get a little bit of information about them. So get your business in front of millions of hungry diners with up to eight times better search performance online. There's probably a reason that when you search for a specific type of food or a specific type of restaurant, that Yelp shows up first as a, as a SEO result and really put into practice some of the lessons that folks that have talked about restaurant marketing on this podcast have shared here and use Yelp to get there. For the first 10 folks that sign up using the link in the description, Yelp for Restaurants is paying business owners a $100 Visa gift card for booking a demo so you can see this tool in action and ultimately decide if this is something that could help your business. If you check it out and love it, Emulsion Podcast listeners also get three months free off of their annual subscription, making sure that you can get all the benefits with a pretty awesome discount. I also wanted to add, because I don't think most folks know about these dot points, no employee at Yelp has the ability to override the decisions that the software makes. I didn't know that. Also, there's no connection between advertising on Yelp and how the recommendation software treats a business's ratings and reviews. Again, this is not pay to play. Uh, that, you know, what, whatever has been pro proliferating, that is not the case. So again, check the link in the description and sign up and claim the $100 Visa gift card for business owners that book a demo while supplies last, or you can check out justincona.com slash Yelp. Are you maximizing the revenue opportunities for your business? These days, customers want delivery, they want pickup, and they want online ordering at their fingertips. And DoorDash is powering more than half a million businesses to do just that. The infrastructure that you can get through DoorDash allows for you to get direct feedback in order to improve your customer experience and tailored recommendations to increase your sales. They've also launched a new partnership package where the commissions paid to DoorDash can be as low as just 15% or just 6% on pickup orders, giving you access Access to millions of users that are browsing the app without any additional marketing effort for you. That was shocking to me because I thought the only option available through partnering with DoorDash was something like 30%. 
right? So DoorDash is offering listeners of the Emulsion podcast 0% commission, so you pay nothing on the first 30 days for the first 10 folks that sign up with the link in the description. You can also head to justinconnacom slash DoorDash and learn more, unlock new revenue streams for your business, and connect with more customers than ever before with DoorDash. Brandon, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's a delight to have you. Great to have, I'm great to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. Of course. Uh, I mean, huge props to uh, my friend Adam, who runs a, a content channel called Omnivorous Adam that just kind of like tagged you and was like, you guys should jam on this whole thing. So we, we use the yeah. interwebs to kind of get connected here. And I think we're going to talk about a bunch of interesting topics. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, when, at what point do you make that decision that you're going to kind of like capture your first piece of content? You know what? It was easy for me. Listen, when COVID hit, when COVID hit, I realized like, okay, I can't just be dependent on this W-2 like income. And not only that, it's like, I realize I've come to a place in my life as a chef where I am 35 years old and I have nothing to show for it. Absolutely nothing. I don't have a personal brand. I don't have this. I don't have that. And I'm just like, this is crazy. I don't have anything. And not to say that I don't have anything, but I have the experience of running restaurants for other chefs. You know what I'm saying? Like all in, uh, like working seven days a week for other chefs, living out their vision. And not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but you get to a certain point in your career where you become like, I'll put, I'll put it this way. I wanted to, when I wasn't a sous chef, I wanted to be a sous chef so bad, so bad. Once I became a sous chef, I did not want to be a sous chef anymore. <laughs> I wanted to be the executive, the executive sous. And the same goes for chef de cuisine and same goes for executive chef. When I got to the executive chef title, I'll be honest. It's not what the hype is about. You know what I'm saying? You're putting out fires every single day. Like you're barely cooking. And for me, what I realized is, man, I have nothing to show for it. I need to start building my own personal brand. And just to fast forward a little bit, you know, I started creating content and shout out to Gary V because he's like, you know, I was so scared to post because I didn't want my top level chefs to think anything different of me or like, you know what I'm saying? This term celebrity chef has such a bad connotation. And I'll be honest, I started posting on TikTok, man. I was like, you know what? I'm going to commit to posting every single day for at least 60 days. That's what Gary V said. He said, post every single day for commit, right? And it's so funny because the day I was about to give up, okay? This, the day I was like, okay, it's not working. My account's not going anywhere. I'm, you know, 800 followers, whatever. I swear to you, I made a do. I was like, I'm just going to do a duet because, uh, you know, it's easy. 30 seconds. It's no problem. I go into the bathroom at work. I duet somebody doing an op off steak and I just give them some feedback. And it's crazy because this video was not professionally shot. It was my selfie cam on my iPhone. The lighting was horrible and it goes viral, right? Media it immediately takes off. And that was the birth of Chef Authorized. And it was crazy because ever since that day, I made a commitment that I am going to side hustle this, um, you know, this content creation thing and become a social media influencer, so to speak. And I'll be honest, it doesn't happen overnight. And I really wish that, you know, taking consideration, listen, it's the bar the barrier to entry is very low, right? You can... I think people get so caught up in, oh, I need to have this camera. I need to be like this. I need to be like that. Listen, just shut up and post. Shut up and hit record. Post it. Don't worry about what anybody else is going to think. The biggest thing that you have to remember is we want to hear what you have to say. As a content creator, look, I don't have, you know, three to five million followers, but I have a decent following. But the thing is, is like what people don't realize is like there is just in, to give you an example there is six billion people on tiktok there is an audience for you <laughs> there's plenty of room for all of us same thing with ig look listen my we all started out at zero okay we all started out at zero followers and i think it's really important to just commit to posting and post and don't worry about it and just get better like you don't become a professional chef the, the day you, you sign up for culinary school, the day you decide to start cooking, it's the same thing with influencing. It's the same thing with creating content. And guaranteed, when you look at my videos from uh, you know a year and a half ago to right now, I'm just getting started. And I'm so I excited to see, yeah, I'm so excited to see what the future holds. I, I love all the threads to kind of pull on there. So, so I'm gonna take it back to your experience. Is there 
you, you, you talked about kind of like working your, your way through the brigade and kind of like spending time at restaurants that, that you were passionate about working at. Is there a specific day to kind of get a, a, a deeper, some more texture to your background? Is there a day when you kind of like realize that, damn, I can cook. Like I'm actually good at this. Yes. At a restaurant? Yes, 100%. There's actually a few few experiences I've had like that. One, my first my first experience was at Alinea, okay? And this was great. I So just to go back a little bit, I'm going to kind of cut my story up a little bit. But I went to Alinea as a sous chef. I went from Oriel, Las Vegas, working with a, a Michelin star French chef who, and, you know, before that I was at Cafe Blue. But um, I went to Alinea as a sous chef, started as a cook. I didn't start as a comi. I got lucky because I was like, hey, bro, I don't want to start at the bottom. I'm going to be honest. It ain't going to work for me. But, you know, can I at least start at a cook level? You'll see my ability, blah, blah, blah. And I remember this specific time when uh, the chocolate guy didn't show up, and the uh, it was it was a nightmare. We start we're starting. Is this it's for Tuesday. The table dessert, the one. That the the chocolate ball. ball, the balloon. Oh, got it. Yeah, yep, yep. he was just listen. Just like hundreds of cooks that I see, like fuck it, I'm not. I can't do this, right? Like literally, deer in the headlights. And it's so funny because we're in our chef meeting, and they're like, okay, so and so is not here. I'm not going to put him on blast. He's like, so and so is not here. Does anybody know how to make chocolate? And I'm like, and I shot my hand up, knowing, knowing that I just completely fucked myself. But the thing is, is I am classically trained in savory and pastry, right? And so I knew that, okay, I was on the hot app station. Um, at that time, it was the, uh, the truffle, the uh, truffle soup with the potato ball and um, uh, the, in the wax bowl. But I knew that I, dessert didn't start until 730. So I had plenty of time after I set up my station to temper chocolate. And then the executive chef looks at me. He's like, you know how to temper chocolate? I'm like, yes, chef, I do. He's like, yeah, right. Like, yeah, right. I'm like, but you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it sous vide though. I think that's ridiculous. You want to keep chocolate as far away from water as possible because at Alinea, the standard was to double bag it and drop it in a circulator. And yeah. And I was like, that is just, that makes no sense. But anyway, so I took on this burden and it was funny because I set up my station and I did the chocolate and, um, you know, in the, and chef was just watching over, he was like watching over me. He was waiting for me to fuck up, but I didn't. And boy, was I stressed. I was sweating. I swear to God, I lost five pounds that day. But I remember, I remember the look he gave me when it was, when it was go time, the pressure was on and he looks at me and I'm like, and I think in my head, I'm like, yeah, yeah, bitch. I know how to fucking cook. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know how to do it. Like, you're not going to fucking crush my soul, dog. Uh-uh. Like he literally told the sous chef, he's like, hey, go check over his station. Make sure everything's tight, you know? And I'm like, yeah, come on, come on, bring it on. And I'm like, I know how to fucking cook, dog. Let's do this. You know what I'm saying? Awesome. And it was awesome. it was funny. That was the moment though. Then there, I'll tell you about another moment. Yeah, please, this is, another one. I was going to ask for another one. Yeah. This, so basically, um, I then went to work with the Wolfgang Puck group, right? And uh, so I'm in LA. I'm in LA. I'm, I'm the chef de cuisine at Hotel Bel Air, and uh, Wolfgang comes in, and um, this is one of the first times I'm cooking for him. But this man tells me, "Make me something I've never had before." Like, <laughs> I'm like, "What, <laughs> dude?" And he's like, "Also, I'm vegan tonight." And uh, let me tell you something. Yeah, it was like, "Oh, so we like a challenge." This was to like push you. Yes, one hundred percent. So he wasn't actually vegan. This was no. just to push you. He said, I'm, I'm vegan tonight and I want something that I've never made before, that I've never had before. And at first I was like, fuck, like what? And of course, you know, at that time I'm already working a station. Like, you know, it was just ridiculous. But anyway, I made him this Swiss chard roasted, I'm sorry, the celery rack that was roasted, wrapped in Swiss chard. Some It was really good. It was a really good put together dish. I made a, a chocolate mole that was also very of a vegan, but it was really like uh, spicy pepper forward. It was just a really good vegan dish, and I made him a you know a couple of other dishes. But I remember him coming, texting me and saying, "Hey, that was really good," and that was it. That was all that came from him. And I'm like, "Damn, yes, yes, I got it right." Like I was just so amped up. All right, but then the next time, um, and I'll be honest. So uh, Joshua Skeens, uh, yeah. the executive chef or the chef Saison founder anglers. So I, I was in San Francisco, I'm doing a tasting. And, um, and it's funny because I'm came, flew from LA to do this tasting. And I'll be honest, Joshua Skeen's chef has the, one of the best palates I've ever came across in my life. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, on that skill set, you know, like there's a lot of people who say dude, bad things about working for him, but on, yeah. on that metric that he's dude, all time, all time, dude, it was absolutely, I got some crazy stories too, but 
But anyway, just to give you a little context, I joined the Saison group to work on the two new angler projects. But when I did my tasting, when I did my tasting, I remember doing my tasting and um, I cooked a piece of Miyazaki Wagyu. And I remember Skeens coming to the pass and he's like, hey, man, I fucking hate Wagyu. And I was like, oh, shit. He's like, but that was delicious. And I was like, like what? <laughs> like, he's like, I was like, hold up. God damn it, dude. It was such a fucking brain fuck. But like his, the way he, the way he came across though, was basically what he, you know, it was good. It was, he was like, I don't like Wagyu, but that was fucking delicious. He was and I was like, your execution. Yeah. And basically, and the reason is, is because Wagyu is such a fatty piece of meat. I like to pair it with homemade kimchi. And then also something super umami rich, savory, but light. And I only serve a two to three ounce piece. It's a small plate. And uh, I make a homemade hoisin sauce that's very umami rich. I don't use any salt and I cover the outside of the steak and let it marinate for like 20 minutes. Then I hit it on the, on the coals. But anyway, he, it was funny because that was a moment where I was like, okay, like, all right, I'm in it. Like if it's good enough for this three Michelin star chef, like let's do this. But yeah, that was, that was it. So many good stories. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing that. I, I, I think that there's um, those. Those are some of my favorite ways to kind of like hop back through someone's kind of like um, career trajectory point because it's like um, I call it a, like a graduation moment where you kind of you yeah. sit there and you're like, damn, because there's there's a lot of um, contributing factors that make you want to feel lesser than from like you know imposter syndrome, expectations of your superiors, like uh, the guest giving you like. It's, it's, it's the same thing that you get on social media sometimes where it's like you can have a bunch of really good moments, but the one bad comment makes you feel like shit sometimes. Um, yeah. And so, I, yeah, thank, thank you for sharing some of those. Um, so, so you've worked at all these places, and in my research on you, I was, I was identifying some, some points that you had um, made about staging and how you kind of like think about work. And so I'm curious, how did you initially approach staging? And then how have those opinions kind of like evolved over time for you? Yeah. You know what? That's a great question. I'm glad you brought it up. So back in the day, I used to stage as many chances as I could get, right? I mean, I would offer, I would leverage my time for, you know, for like just the experience. So I staged at everywhere you could imagine in New York, DC, Chicago, Vegas. Um, and then, but what I realized is over time, I feel like it's kind of, it is beneficial to the cook, but I also feel like it's a waste of time. And let me explain. Um, if you go as a stagiaire, you're going to get, you're not going to get the experience that you need to be successful. So let me put things in perspective. I'm a, I'm a different breed. Okay. I, I, when I, when I went to culinary school, I already had the basic, basic cook fundamentals. I just went for the piece of paper, right? So when I went to stage, I was literally, I went into the place like I was on fire, okay? And so I was doing different jobs than, let's say, somebody who just came fresh out of CIA for an internship. You're going to get the tasks that are not going to help out your future. Picking lettuce, picking herbs, sweeping the floor, doing all of these things. I think that does a due diligence, like it doesn't do you any justice to get that experience. I would recommend getting hired, as a paid employee, because you will be held accountable. And trust me, the, the reason why I say that is because when I grew up as a cook, you needed to stay in a place for a year or more, or it's no good. Now that has changed. Now that has changed. If you get six months out of, out of a place and you're like, I don't fucking like this. I'm going to go down to the restaurant down the street. It's acceptable. And so a lot of people, um, ask me, Hey, what do you think about staging? I think it's great, but I would actually recommend pick a restaurant that you, that, that you want to work at. Like, don't, you know, <laughs> you, there's enough information with employees giving reviews, reviews on the internet, social media, where you can make a, you can make a logical decision on whether you want to work there or not. Right. I'm sure you can agree. When I was growing up as a cook in 2010, I couldn't see if Cafe Balud was like, I just knew that it was Daniel's restaurant. I didn't know the chef was a lunatic, but you know what? I went there and I worked and like I staged, I did a tryout. And that's different than a stage, but I did a tryout. I got hired, but um, nowadays I think it's best if you get hired as a cook, a comey or a prep cook at an entry level. And if it doesn't work out within 90 days, then you roll out. But that way you're held accountable and you actually have job duties. You will learn so much more very quickly. I think that's a great, like so many people like, to, people like binaries, right? Like, like us as humans like binary decisions call them rules because it allows us to kind of like 
take a look at options or take a look at a specific idea and 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 have a decision that is like societally acceptable industry acceptable like we it helps us offload that decision making process to something else and i think it's important to acknowledge that like there are so many underlying variables with staging where there's like at what state is the industry in are we you know 2013 when the industry was like it was impossible to get a job anywhere because everything was yeah. super competitive or are we just coming out of covid and like everybody has opportunities available uh is it a position where you're going to be doing what you were sharing where you're picking lettuce and uh picking herbs and sweeping the floor or is it a, is it is it a situation where you previously had no experience but you as a stagiaire at this place gets paired up with the garmage chef to party and you're going to get to plate all service and help them with their prep list two very different stage experiences yeah. uh, simultaneously are you going there for one or two days just to kind of check it out and get your feet wet and potentially give yourself some exposure to an environment like a two michelin star or a three michelin star restaurant or is this something where where you're going to go for a month unpaid and you're just continued to do the the grunt boring work all the time and you're gonna you've wasted quote unquote like you've gotten the the, the experience of that experience by day three and you're gonna spend 27 more days at that place i think that there's so many underlying things that people don't like to talk about and and the label of staging is good staging is bad i mean you're yeah. looking at two guys who have had immense benefits to taking staging experience and really kind of like using it as a tool to kind of like step up to the next level or kind of like because i don't know if you can empathize with this but i used a lot of my staging experience to see different environments so that when the right opportunity came i was like yeah that's the one like i i, I want to work at that place because i just had no context man like when i yeah. was in culinary school and i was staging i didn't know what a, what made a good kitchen i didn't know what like how how service was run i didn't know any of that stuff you know i was like culinary school was my exposure and so i used it as kind of like an experimentation realm to kind of see how different kitchens operate so i don't know if you yeah. have, have a reaction to all That's of that no, you know what? That's a great point. And I think, you know, that's why I try to say, I tell a lot of people it's user specific. Like if somebody says, hey, chef, should I go to culinary school? It's like, well, <laughs> well, hold up now. <laughs> like, but it really depends. Like, I don't know. Are you in the military? Is your Are your parents paying for it? Are you paying for it? What type of chef do you want to be? Like, there's so many questions that come along with that. But I do agree with you. Like, if you have the means, like if I could go back I would have saved my money for culinary school. I would have took out a personal loan and I would have went across Europe and backpacked into Michelin rated restaurants. But I think at that time, like, I mean, I don't know, at 19, I was, you know, so fucking dumb. Like I, I couldn't, all I knew is I wanted to know how to, I just wanted to cook. I knew that, but that's all I had to hold on to. But I do agree. Like if you have the opportunity to go stage at a really high end restaurant for three months, my absolute advice is don't suck do you need to outwork everybody else make yourself visible because guess what man as chefs when we're running restaurants we have blinders on i can't tell you how many times where i would be working at alinea and you know we had the townhouse right next door where uh you know it was like the herb picking house we kept all the chef's garden stuff and um you know I'll be honest, most stages didn't make it over to the restaurant, bro. They just stayed over there and worked into oblivion. You know what I'm saying? And I had the same experience when I was uh, – so I staged at Noma for a week, and I had the same experience of seeing people who just didn't – they just didn't take their head up from the cutting board. Like they were just completely fine just kind of like shingling out rose petals or cleaning celery with a little brush. And I think that that's such a missed opportunity. Now, not to say that you need to go into the kitchen that you're staging at and all of a sudden start, like, you know, networking up a storm. But I think that there's a difference between being a wallflower in a restaurant and actually realizing that there are networking opportunities everywhere you look when you're staging at a place from the sense of, like, you can have a conversation with the butcher and then all of a sudden that – because, like – and I'm sure you've experienced this too – all of a sudden – Three months later, that person has opened up a new cool wine bar down the street that, like, you'd be really interested in working at. And, oh, we we both were at XYZ. We were both at Bennu at the same time. Holy shit. Like, let's let's collaborate yeah. on something like that. So there's benefits outside of just the, the work experience you're going to get, too, to staging. Yeah. You know what? Here's a, here's a good here's a good, um, here's a good point. Um, and, I God, I hate keep bringing up Alinea, but it's just yeah, part no, of my career good. because yeah. it's a good example. I started at Alinea when uh, they did the collaboration with 11 Madison Park. 
And yep. so, yep, yep, yep. I mean, this kitchen was a madhouse, right? But the thing is, is my first day, I made sure I was on fire. And guess what? He's, I remember the chef saying, hey, we want this guy over here. And uh, so I came to the main kitchen and, um, you know, it was funny because my first task was making sure the root ends of these baby leeks were absolutely spotless for this dish. And I remember the CDC saying, there needs to be zero dirt in here. Like, he's like, do you understand what zero is? And I'm like, yes, absolutely. Yes, chef. And I stood over the sink for, you know, 10 hours straight cleaning every single one of these leaks by hand. I went through them like two, three, four more times. And I remember like taking a little bit, going to the chef and I'm like, chef, is this acceptable? And he said, yes, absolutely. Make sure every single one is like that. And I said, okay. And then once I did that task really good, my next task was making sure the carrot tartare grinder was clean. And it was funny because whoever was doing it before, it was fucking it up. They were, you know, they were sending out dirty ones or whatever. And I remember putting on like a food runner jacket and he's like, I need you to make sure these are clean. Uh, that was when James Kent was the CDC. And, uh, and it was so funny cause I, man, I made sure that shit was spotless. My guy, like it doesn't matter the task. What people don't understand is why do I have to do this? Or like the attitude, like, dude, it doesn't matter. Like you're this situation of you cleaning the carrot grinder is not going to matter in five years. You just need to do the best of your ability. And of course, like this will get you farther, but I know what you're saying. A lot of people, you know, they can hide behind the cutting board or they just want to, you know, they just want to say, Hey, I worked at Noma, but zero context. Like, you know, they just want to put Noma on the resume. Like I totally get it, but it's like, I want to know what you did there. <laughs> totally. totally. It's why I, uh, I had to, this will serve as an answer to a question I've gotten a couple of times in the past couple of weeks. People have asked how to identify stages that they've done on their resume. And I don't, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this. What I did was I created in the same way that you have like an extracurriculars when you're kind of like applying for whatever on your resume, I would have a stagiaires section of my resume and I would just put yeah. the restaurant and the date that I stage there because don't, my advice and the, the point of this is don't lump it in with your work experience because yeah. as we're, you and I are both discussing right now, they're not the same. You mm -hmm. having the accountability of being a paid employee, running a station, XYZ responsibilities that you might have as a W-2 person is different than what you have as a stash. And so, but don't, don't not say that because I think, and you and I are both testaments of this, the people who are staging are the, usually the people who are like what you're saying. They can show up fired up, excited, on their time off. That, that's, this is all they're thinking about. They constantly want to improve themselves, see new things, meet new people. And so have a separate section of your resume that says stage, stages, stagiaire, and then you just put the name of the restaurant and the date that you stage there, or maybe the yep. date window. And that really helped me. I'd be curious if you have thoughts. Yeah. That. So I do the, actually, I do the same exact thing that you did. Obviously the time, you know, my last stage was, you know, in 2010. So, uh, or, yeah, 2010. So what I do is I, it's at the bottom of my res resume and I just put, you know, staged here you know, the name of the restaurant, Michelin stars. And then the, I put the year now, I don't put the nice. specific date, but yep. I just put the year yep, yep, yep. and I believe it or month, not month and month and year, I think is what I would do. Yeah. Yeah. And date. yeah. And like, the thing is, is, you know what I've been doing now, uh, Justin is I've been, so basically I have a, like a, a 90 second video of my full portfolio. Tight. And let me tell you something, this has shaken some heads, right? So I've used my video creator experience to, to like, I pulled these iPhone videos from way back in the day. Cause you gotta remember like when we grew up in the kitchen, you wouldn't dare pull your phone out, bro. I, dude, I got caught once pulling my phone out and that was it for me, man. That was, I almost got thrown in the fryer. And, um, you know, and it wasn't even like anything, I wasn't even snapping a picture or anything. I was like trying to turn it off because the notifications were on. And I remember the chef, like, like absolutely losing it, like deep end losing it. He just needed somebody to, to yell at. I get it. But, um, it wasn't until like 2015, 2016, where it became socially acceptable in a kitchen to, you know, be pull out your phone. So, but great points I, though. But I, I put it, I put my stages at the bottom of my resume all the way at the bottom. That's tight. I had the same thing. I had to uh, take photos for my externship manual before I went back to school. And I'd remember this just today because my dad was like a, a film photographer. I did film photography competitions in high school. I've, I've loved cameras my basically my whole life. And mm. so I had kind of like a small DSLR that I had just brought into the restaurant to take pictures with. And the looks that I got, man, when I pulled out that Oof. camera and I was taking photos of stuff, it was like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, like yeah. so many strange looks. And now... It's like you see that people are doing like 
like we're, we're saying photo shoots during service there's like the private dining room's empty cool like let's set up a backdrop and do some photos like let's go over to the window and and take some great pictures because that's what we're going to post on social media it's the the, the it, everything's changed and I, I agree with you i wish i had more content of myself when yeah. i was working at all these places that i that i yeah because i got some boo-boo i got some boo-boo pictures that's like you know 2040p yeah. <laughs> yep, 240p exactly. But it's fine because it's kind of like tells a story. But you know what? And I want a, a little pro tip out there. I, for any chefs out there or any um, young management or whatever, put it in the PNL. You need to have somebody. You need to put it on your labor module to have somebody in charge of social media and then tie that to you because it can happen. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Trust me. You need somebody in the kitchen with a GoPro. You need somebody filming some shit. Grab a food runner. Say, hey, can you do this? Right? Like. It's very important nowadays because people are genuinely interested in the way you cook, the way you, you, what you do at the restaurant. You know what I'm saying? Now, listen, I know this is a double edged sword because sometimes kitchens get nasty, bro. Like, <laughs> as a chef, it needs to be documented, right? Yeah. 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 I would do anything to get the food out. And, uh, you yeah, know, I know yeah. that, like, there was a, there was an old YouTube video of me, like, dude, I was at, uh, in Las Vegas and I was screaming at the food runner, man. And it's really embarrassing. And I was like, dude, I can never, I can make, I have to make sure this never surfaces because you can't do that anymore. You know what I'm saying? And I just remember, like, you see the vein coming out of my head and I'm like, bashing my hand bashing my fist on the on the on the on the pass and i'm just like so embarrassed man i'm like taking it back but um i think that's really important just to note yeah i think it's uh i i shared this when i share this every any time that there's a big controversy that that comes out and we don't have to spend too long on this but i, I want to put a punctuation mark on that because i think that it's important for people to acknowledge that like the industry and people's perception and 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 just society as a whole has changed a lot in the past 10 years, like more yeah. than the thir probably the 30 years before it. And there are recent examples of people who have these issues that come out. And I just think that there's like sweeping it under the rug or pretending like it didn't happen. Like even the fact that you're willing to be so open about it, I think is like, cool. Like that's, that's, it should be done more. Like, I'm yeah. not going to try to lie and say that I didn't scream at food runners in the past or whatever, like what you just said. <laughs> it's like, no, it happened, but like, it's not okay now. And that's not no. something that I'm going to do anymore. And then more yeah. and more on, more on top of that is like making that acceptable to be had as a conversation makes it so that we can like, we can acknowledge progress versus just like, oh, we need to cancel Brandon because this one time in 2013, he yelled at a food yeah. runner. It's like, I don't think that's interesting. Yeah. 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 Seriously. But um, yeah, I can honestly say that my leadership style changed once I had my first child. Like, okay, it, which like, was when overnight Put that on the timeline for us. So basically, it was 2016. Got it. And Got it. base and and I'll just give you a, a quick summary. Please. Before when I came out of Alinea, man, and I went back to Las Vegas, man, I was uh, I was oof, I was rough, man. So ego driven. Like I would walk in the kitchen and people would be kind of like scared, but not like in a bad way. Like they would just be really intimidated, you know. And mm -hmm. I remember. I remember working this way for about like six months. Then my son was born. And this is what I try to tell young leaders is I'm, and I say, look, you would never fire your child. You would do whatever it takes to build them and mold them. And you need to offer all the value. And it's really important that you work for your employee. They don't work for you. And I'm telling you, once this perception changed, my job got so much easier, right? Where, you know, I'll just give you, I'll give you a good example Please, I was going to ask for some because, like, make it tangible yeah. for us. Yeah. So basically, here's the thing. I remember as a chef, um, you know, being so pissed when people would ask off for Friday and Saturday, right? Like, what? What? Why? What the f hell? What is your problem? And I remember, especially at Hotel Bel Air, like when Coachella come out, dude, I would get anxiety because all my cooks would want to go. And or like when the new Jordans came out, people would rather, you know, spend Friday night sleeping outside a Foot Locker. They don't give a shit about the station, right? Who cares about Saturday night service? But then what I realized is like, okay, you know what? I'm going to lean into this and I'm going to say, hey, listen, how about this? What, you guys can pick out of a hat and one of you get Friday off and you buy the shoes for the other guy. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, oh, chef, for real? You, you be willing to do that? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I'm like, okay. And then I lined up all seven cooks. I'm like, listen, all y'all can't go to Coachella, but four of you can go. So how about you guys go these two days and then you guys go this two days or whatever the case may be. And I think meeting them in the middle gave me so much more equity, like sweat equity and loyalty. And same thing with, you know, um, in, in Las Vegas, another good example is like, I remember saying no when, uh, you know, my Latinos asked for, to go to the San Vincent, 
Vincente concert. It was in Caesar's Palace. And um, I, he was there for two weeks. And the first weekend I said no. And they were all butthurt. I was like, no, we can't all take. But anyway, I saw the aura of the staff. And I'm like, you know what? Okay, how can I get to a better resolution? So you know what I did? I scheduled me and the other four sous chefs. And I'm like, okay, look, I want all y'all to go to the San Vicente concert this Saturday. And they freaked out. They were like, what? I'm like, yeah, I, I want you guys to enjoy your time. This is just one day. We'll get over it. Yeah, I went down that night. We all went down. But the loyalty that I got from the um, from the cooks was just absolutely so worth it, right? And that's why I try to tell you know young leaders like, you never fire your kids. <laughs> you need to think the same about your employees, like, and see what's valuable to them. I know it's not good as a chef to get into people's personal life, but I've had so much more success with saying, "Hey, how are you doing? How's the wife? How's the kids? Okay, great." But you also still have to hold people accountable, so it's a it's a gray area. But I'm telling you. Get to know what moves your, what motivates your, your, your cooks and your employees. I think an important part there that I just want to like really double click on for the audience is the point you made about, cause I teach this in my, uh, in my course for chefs, which is the concept of you work for your team. Your team doesn't work for you. Mm. And I think where that commonly it's, it's difficult to put that into practice or it's, it's hard to parse what that means sometimes for people because they will sometimes think, to your example, okay, people want to go to Coachella. This means if I work for my team, this means I have to let them go and I work their station. And it's not that. It's you mm -hmm. coming up with the system of we're going to put the names in a hat and we're going to decide who can go. Like you creating that system is you working for your team. That's the exactly. punchline versus this idea that like you have to make everybody's problems go away or whatever. And it's not to take any accountability away from you or responsibility away from you. But I think that's the point that often gets missed is people say, okay, cool. I work for my team. Therefore, I should do everything that they have to do. And oftentimes when you first become a leader, you are often the one that could jump into any station. You could run any, any part of the, you could make any dish. You could do any prep because you have those skills. It doesn't mean you do that. It means you yeah. are responsible for creating the tools or the systems or the structures for the team to function at their highest level. And I think that's what gets missed with that statement sometimes. Yeah, 100%. I agree with that totally. And you know what? I've, I did that for years where I would just do the work. I would kick people off the station and do the work. But what I realized is it does nothing. It just crushes their soul. And then the thing is, is like, you know, you got to, you, your work, you're doing the job, but instead I remember specifically, and I'll just give one example. I remember a, this station was going down it was hot app station. And I was like, and we'll just say his name's James. And I'm like, I'm like, James, like, you got to get it together, man. Your station's not set up properly. I'm like, look, 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 just watch, just watch me stand over here and just watch me. Okay. Seriously. This is not, I'm not coming down on you. I want you to see how I, uh, I how I operate, but I'm like, first go grab me bolognese, diced tomatoes, cilantro that, you know, I'm telling him, Hey, go grab me this stuff first. Boom. And I made him watch me for a half an hour, get everything organized. And then I held his hand through the next, you know, hour, you know what I'm saying? And I think this is really important. Whereas before I would just kick him out, work the station and then, you know, kind of laugh at him like, ha ha, I can do this, but it doesn't help him. You know, it doesn't help and grow him. So that's also a really important and great point. I want to go back to when you were talking about chefs having leverage opportunities using social media and the oper the the just the reach that it has the ever expanding demand that exists we will never fill the content hole that it, that exists on any of these platforms but what i what i want you to potentially do is not sell us on the importance of it because i think that there's there's a certain element of like People just need to hear the information either enough times or in the right way to, to kind of, or maybe they'll never come around. This is what Gary Vee calls selling the unsellable. It's like, this is, I don't, I don't want you to talk to that person. Mm -hmm. Picture the person who is on the fence. They have potentially bought a little bit of gear. They've maybe had a little bit of experience being on camera, but they're really just kind of like, they're feeling a little bit of either analysis paralysis, maybe a little bit of imposter syndrome. They're like, should I start this? What do you have to say to that person? So, well, that's, oof. that's a really good question because in all honesty, it takes time and it takes patience and it takes perseverance. So do you develop a routine? Like what, what, what do you, what do you do? So you said you yeah. waited for 60 days. Maybe there's some yeah. mistakes that you need to introduce. Yeah. And so what I, what I commonly say with 
because the biggest reason why people don't post is because they're kind of intimidated of what other people are going to say. But then also if they turn off their comments, they're also going to get called out. So my, my biggest thing, and it's kind of like the same with anything, and I know it's kind of generic, but it's get comfortable being uncomfortable. Make the mistake. Call something wrong. Pronounce something wrong. Do it intentionally. Like, do it because the thing is, is what I tell people is like, don't get caught up on the minuscule. Like, you, if you asked me what I posted a year and a half ago when I started social media, I couldn't even tell you. It doesn't even matter. I posted a super controversial video that got over, you know, has over 6 million views. I wanted to take it down so many times. But it was such a good learning lesson for me. I literally wanted to take it down every single day for the next seven, eight days. And um, because of the reaction I got from it, people were like, oh my God, this guy's gatekeeping. What, who are you? You're an ass, you're this name calling. But I'm like, no, this is a good lesson. This is a really good lesson for me. Listen, once I close the TikTok app, once I close the social media, I have my beautiful wife, my family. Like, it's not my main source of income. You know what I'm saying? Like, I am good in my personal life. But for the younger person, this could be detrimental, right? This, they could, you know, it, it really could. But what I recommend is make the mistakes. Failing is success, you know? And you'll never know until you try. Commit to 90 days of posting every day. 60 to 90 days, whatever you can do. Everybody has a phone. Everybody, I don't want to hear, oh, I don't know how to use the app. I don't know how to post videos. YouTube it. Google it. Stop making excuses. One of my, one of my good creator friends, he just recently upgraded to a uh, mirrorless camera. He's been using an iPhone. He has over 2 million followers. Okay. Over a mil on YouTube. Okay. Oh, you know, half a mil on Instagram. He's been using an iPhone this whole time and iMovie. <laughs> so clutch. clutch. Yeah, yeah. You don't need all the fancy tools. Yeah, bro. I got a whole editing team in the Philippines. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I outsource my editing, but that's because I, I have to, you know, I have to delegate my time, you know, I, in like editing just bogs me down so much. Two, two things there. So the first being, if you're listening to, to us speak and you're like, okay, they said, they said post for 90 days straight every single day. And what I'm worried about, Brandon, to be honest, is like, that might actually be too big of a hill to, to start with. Yeah. So yeah. I guess, do you right. see some value in potentially even going one rung lower than that? And maybe it's shoot something every day for 90 days. You don't have to post it, but like yeah. clearly the fact that you're not excited about posting potentially comes from the fact that you're feeling a little bit of like in, in insufficiency in maybe your production skills or how you look on camera or you're getting it does the thing where like right before you hit post it like plays your voice over and over and over again and you're just like listening to yourself and you're like man i don't necessarily want to do that what helped me and i'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this is like the the first five videos i shot for youtube never got shared they're still unlisted videos on my channel but i went all the way before i hit publish just so i could get used to that so that i could write a script set my camera up, read it to the camera, put it in the editing software, edit it, and like get those reps in so that when it came time to do the publishing part, it was like I, I it was like baby steps kind of thing. And that helped me a lot. I'm I'm curious if if that you see that as valuable or it's just like rip the band-aid. And this is going to speak differently to different people. So I'm just trying to give yeah. different perspectives here. Well, I think I think I think you could go both ways, right? Yeah. So like yeah. let's so 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 here's the thing. It's like you know I'm the type of person where I'm a go-getter, right? Yeah. I'm a, I'm very yeah. self-motivated. I'm very self-motivated. Yep. My wife, not so much when it comes to social media. Like she could care less. I said, hey, you could get the new iPhone if you post YouTube videos of you working out. You know, this is this is the deal. You get the new iPhone. This is this was our like kind of like side deal. But I want to see three videos a week on YouTube. You know, right. and it was funny because like she started and then it just fell off. Like, yep. Yep. same thing with TikTok. Same Classic. thing with IG. And the thing is, is like, ultimately, it's just kind of not her thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, right, that's, right, right, right. that's the thing. So, so like, yes, I create content and it's, a, and it's, it's a, like, honestly, it's a grind. It's literally a grind, but I actually love the process. I love the process. It keeps me fresh, like with creating content, but 
it's really user specific. I would have to meet the person and then give them direction. Do you know what I'm saying? Because because I've had look, I've had people reach out and say, "Hey, chef, I started posting content because of you." And then I also have people saying, "Man, I just because I told I this is what I said. I I said, "Hey, listen, if you I'm so sorry, but I just have so many comments on TikTok like if you don't have any pictures on your profile or if it's private or whatever the case may be, I'm just not going to respond. Like, because this is where the trolls are at and I feel bad, but like some people reached out and said, well, I just don't have any content because I don't want to, I don't want to post or I don't, I don't know how to do it or, and like the advice is tailored to that specific person. So you kind of need to figure out what works best for you. It's not a one size fits all. I'd be curious if you have a reaction to potentially this insight too, that, that really helped me as I was kind of tr not trying to sell the unsellable, but just kind of have these conversations with people who see something on social media or they see the power of having a channel or having an audience. And you, you, this is in reaction to your point about having an editing team. If you are the type of chef who doesn't see yourself as the kind of like, I want to be a creator forever. Or I want to turn to be, uh, uh, be being a, a video person, but I see the power in it. You spending the time to understand what it means to shoot, write, edit, makes you a better evaluator of hiring the people. So like I can imagine it made it super easy for you to identify who's a good editor and who's not because you edited a lot of stuff yourself. And so if you're sitting here and you're listening to this and you're like, okay, well, I see the power in it, but I don't want to be the one doing the video editing, it's like – that's not the point. It's like you getting the chops so that you can, again, to maybe your chocolate example for millennia, it's like you become the person who like can identify a good editor or a good piece of work or good lighting or good audio, like sound design or whatever. Um, so it's like, it's a skill that you can develop in yourself. That's going to make you better at hiring that person for your team. Yeah. If you're going to take Brandon's advice and have a PNL line that says social media person, how are you going to know they're doing a good job if you don't know what it is that they do? Yeah. So, you know, this is a this is a, a rock solid point. I have zero background in cinematography, videography, and I swear I tell everybody all the time, "Hey, I am not a pro at this. I am a chef. I stay in my lane." But constantly brands, constantly people say they reach out and they say, "Your video quality is so good." It didn't happen overnight, okay? And I'll be honest, I'll be honest, I post videos that I know where the sound is messed up or the lighting is off or the ISO is off or the aperture is off. But the thing is, is I put in the work, I put in the reps to get the education I need to be able to do it, right? I know how to edit in Final Cut Pro. I know how to pick up any camera and use it. I don't have a formal education. You have to put in the work. But here's the thing. They're making cameras nowadays that are point and shoot, okay? And a good example of that is the ZVE-10. I got it, and I primarily use this mostly for the vertical videos. And the reason is, is because, I mean, I got I got the Sony a7 III, but I'll tell you what, man, I have to have an external screen. I have to, you know, mess with the settings, and it makes it a little bit inefficient on my end, right? Um, good example is I shot a video outside the other day, but it was at that weird time between 3 and 5 where the sun starts going down, and it's like, you know... Yeah, you have to, you know, you have to, like, it is what it is. But my recommendation is, yes, you need to have some wherewithal on how to, you know, what the process is of editing and filming content so you can hold people accountable. But at the same time, I know a lot of people that don't. They have they have zero interest in, um, you know, editing or having anybody edit it. They're, they're going to stick with the iPhone editing software, like, and edit right into TikTok or edit right on their phone with just the camera app. But it really depends because that could change for somebody that's doing makeup tutorials or somebody that's doing cooking content. So for me, it's you – know, go ahead. It, well, the, uh, finish your point because I, I – yeah. you, you, you're perfectly segueing me. So I yeah. want you to finish your point. Yeah. So like, so like here's a good example. Here's a good example. My sister works for Urban Decay and she does – sometimes she does makeup tutorials and sometimes she doesn't. But um, I told her, I'm like, you need to start posting on YouTube. You have to. Just talk to the camera with the cam – you click record. There's no editing fluff here, right? When we edit food content, it's a little bit different, man. You got to make it like the close-up, the ASMR. There's so many levels to it, right? Um, you know, the the slicing the meat. The, like there's different types of levels in cooking content, 
right? Like, um, you know, and so I think it's just a little bit different, right? Where you have like some of the creators are kind of like vlog style where they take you on a date with me. That doesn't take, that doesn't require that much editing. So it really depends because um, you could also, you could take it any avenue you want, any river you want, right? Like if you, and I think that's important too. This, let's, let's, let's note this too. Fi- figure, trying to figure out what type of content creator you are is very, is very difficult. It's very challenging. Um, but I that think just getting, be my- Go ahead. yeah, I was, I, th- I think, I think just getting started and, uh, you know, doubling down on, you know, like, listen, some things are going to work and some things aren't going to work. I'll be honest. Look, I'm going to use my experience. I like the Michelin level shit, bro. I love could like the partnership I have with Granda keeps me alive. My guy, like <laughs> it just, it, it like, I'm getting chills just talking about it. But guess what, man? TikTok does not want to see that. They want to see the deep fried two pound lobster with the crawfish gel. Yeah, exactly. Like the cheese pool and the French fries and the fried shit. And they want it in 20 seconds. And they want the machine gun editing. And I just got off a conversation with another creator who who's blown up and he has millions of followers now. And he does that. He does exactly what the people want. That, that 16 to 17 year old age bracket where, you know, I, I, you know, like I post something that's super intricate and they click off within 15 seconds because they're just never going to make it. It doesn't interest them. Only 2% of people around the world, I would say 1% of people around the world are that upper echelon dining. You know what I'm saying? Three Michelin star. Now, don't get me wrong. Some, some of my content's cool for chefs like us and other chefs. And I think that's dope. But ultimately you have to, you have to like, I have it broken up. So I'll do. I'll do 60% of what I want to do. Then I do 10% brand deals, 10% machine gun editing, and then 10% duets. And that's exactly what I do at or stitch. And that's how I break down my content. But for me, it's going to be more now geared towards a growth strategy, right? So paying attention more to the analytics, what people want and doing food that people are going to definitely click on and be amazed about. I love these advanced tactics, how you think about you know, not necessarily, you're doing what I mentioned earlier, which is not working in a binary. It's like, no, I see the value in having this kind of like machine gun style editing where it's like quick and it, it gets people in the door and it gets people used to seeing me cook on camera. And then maybe they'll stay for the, you know, whatever other types of content that you're ending up creating. I, I, I'm curious because in, in looking back through your videos, I noticed kind of like, I'm going to call it like a a, a bit of a change or maybe an introduction of you went from like a lot of how to style videos of cooking to actually talking about some of these professional development pieces. And that's obviously Mm -hmm. something that I'm just a a huge fan of. At what point did you decide that you wanted to start talking about that? Or is that something that like you actually find a lot of fulfillment in? And so you like the kind of like messages that come in because you are actually impacting someone um, I'm curious where that came in for you. Cause I, I grappled with the same thing. Yeah. I think the biggest thing for me is like the need of young, the need to, so I think I'm going to level my career where it's time to teach. It's time to coach. Right. And you can't keep what you have unless you give it away. And the thing is, is a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of young culinarians reach out to me about advice. And so I think it's my due diligence as a chef is to absolutely go all in on the next generation of chef right? Make that imprint into the industry. What did you, I, it's all about legacy, man. Like look a year and a half ago when I was thinking I'm like, okay, so COVID hits, we lost everything. What, what do I have? I have nothing. What do I want my kids to remember me as? What am I building? And I'm like, okay, fuck this. I need to build legacy. I want people to know my face. I want them to know my brand and I want to do the right thing. Hopefully that will get me to a, you know, an income at some point, but it, there's no rush. You know, like I'm not rushing, but ultimately I don't, I truly believe, and I think more chefs should do this. They need to share their experience, right? It, but here's the thing. I don't, I'm very adamant about not being like, Hey, this is the way you make beef Wellington. This is the only way I fucking hate that man. Also, I don't want to be compared to Gordon Ramsay or Wolfgang Puck or any, like everybody says, you know, Gordon Ramsay, this Gordon Ramsay, that I'm like, listen, what you guys don't understand is, and this is this, and I'm going to say this because this is important. It's kind of like asking, and I'm not, okay. So let's say if I'm a basketball player, I'm in the NBA and it's kind of like comparing me to Michael Jordan, 
or right. LeBron James, right. Right? right? But Michael Jordan is different than LeBron James because Michael Jordan doesn't play the game anymore. Gordon Ramsay is not in, he's a restaurant tour now. He is a celebrity. He is not cooking. And there's a huge difference. And I need people to know that. It's just like when people are asking Wolfgang Puck about his advice here and his, you know, about what he, the, what he thinks about is what he grew up with. And that has totally changed 160, right? And I think that's really important to note. I want to make sure that um, my legacy is really, like, people associate Gordon Ramsay with the chef that yells and screams in the kitchen, he's belligerent, but I don't know him as that chef. I know him as the chef that worked with Marco Pierre Wright, that has gained three Michelin stars, has multiple Michelin star restaurants, is a rock star chef. That's the chef that I know. And it's just unfortunate because his legacy is kind of tarnished a little bit of being that celebrity chef. And he's working on changing it now. I can see it. Like, you know, on most of his videos now, he's a little bit more positive. You know, he spends time with his family and it's, he's changing that narrative, um, which I think is amazing, but I think it's really important to, to really, um, help do what I can to offer as much value as possible to the up and coming next generation. Because I was that young cook that had nobody, no one. And that's why I'm so adamant about calling out like you'll see, I have some of my videos are controversial because I'm calling out techniques like, hey, listen, I know what you're doing, but nobody taught you right. I'm going to show you. And the reason is, is because I worked at a diner for my first year and a half in my culinary. And unfortunately, I learned a lot of bad techniques, man. And I and then I worked at Macaroni Grill and Cheesecake Factory and learned more and more bad techniques. And it wasn't until I worked with a chef that actually graduated the CIA and he showed me like, hey, I don't know where you learned this from, but you need to not do this ever again in your career. And then he showed me the right way to do things. And I had to go back and unlearn. And the thing that frustrates, frustrates me the most is I asked the questions that I needed to ask, but I just wasn't taught properly. And so, you know, the cooks were so busy. They would just, here's, here's one good tech. I'll shut, I'll, I'll shut up after this, but at the diner, we had a side of chicken wing, uh, chicken wings, right. And they were portioned in plastic bags. And so in order to be faster, he would take the plastic bag with the chicken portion and he would dip it in the fryer. It would melt the plastic, the chicken wings would fall in and then he would throw it in the trash. I learned this as a young cook. Do you know what I did at the fucking steakhouse that I worked at when I was working the fryer station? I was like, yeah, I know how to, I've worked a fryer before. And I take the plastic bag and I dip it in the fryer. I'm like, oh, cool technique, right? See, I learned this. Dude, the chef looked at me. I thought he was, I thought his head was gonna fly off. And he's like, did you just put plastic in the fucking fryer? Can I curse? Hopefully I can curse. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll, yeah, he's like, did you just put plastic in the goddamn fryer? And I'm like, yeah, chef, what's the problem? He's like, what? And he's like, great, go clean it now. Turn it off, get a pot of oil on the stove and clean that fryer. And you're going to clean that fryer and you're, you're going to filter this oil. That's back when you filtered it. And I never forgot that moment. And I promised myself as a chef, I would always, even though it was controversial, I would always say, hey, listen, I've, this is not the proper way, but here it is. Like, let me show you, you know? And um, yeah, that's, I'm sure you can kind of agree. Yeah. I mean, you expressed an interesting dichotomy that I, uh, I want, I want to hear you talk more about this. You, you sure. shared that, that the, the, this type of content where people will say, this is the beef Wellington way, and this is the way to do it. And then you're also saying <clears throat> you will react to, to people that say that you want to put out content that teaches that there is a right way. And so for the person who is looking at both of these options and there's like, there's people who are saying this is the way, but then Brandon's also saying that this is also the way, like how do, but, and, and I'm, I'm saying that not as a gotcha, but I think that there's yeah. like, there's a, there's a nugget here that we can identify. Sure. So like, how do you post yeah. this? Yeah. So, so basically it's funny you say that because like, I agree hundred percent. So, so here's a good example. When I make pickled red onions, I cut them a certain way and other people slice them, you know, the round, like the round way. Right. And I cut them julienne. And the reason, the reason is, is because the texture is better arguably, but that's not to say if you slice them the other direction, like you can do whatever you want in your own house. But I, that's what I say in my video. I say, Hey, I sliced the onion this way because it's a better texture. Now, is that, is that the, you know, the, the stake and the line in the sand of, okay, this is the difference between right and wrong. No, not at all. But the TikTok comment chefs will argue that, oh, chef authorizes, right. Or no, Gordon Ramsay showed me this way. And the thing is, is it's funny because I'm like, okay, let's talk about it. Oh, you don't want to debate about it. 
because that's where it comes in. Yes, people have made pickled red onions for years. I'm sharing you with what I've learned after making them a thousand times, right? I also add a little piece of beet to the pickled red onions to get them super bright red. Is this traditional? Hell no. Do you think anybody's going to waste time if you're cooking for your friends and family to buy a whole beet to cut off two cubes and put it into the red pickled red onions? No, but that's a great point. And I think it's, you know, it's definitely a gray area, but I feel good enough to be able to talk on that, to debate about it. And, you know, in a positive manner, like I don't mind replying to a video at all, but I will admit one of my most controversial videos was there was somebody who was a young chef teaching how to make vegetable stock with all of your vegetable trim. And um, I'll be honest, for me, I never trained this. I never trained young cooks to do this because my golden rule is stock is not a garbage can, okay? Straight up. Start, when, I started at, uh, La, when I started at Spago Las Vegas, the prep cooks would save all of the shit, the mushroom ends, the carrot peels, the potato peels, the celery peels, rutabaga, you name it, dude. And then the prep cook at night would throw it all in a pot and it would simmer overnight into the next day. And I'm not going to lie. I was like, chef, we can't do this. Like, I don't agree with this at all. Now, here's the thing. If you were at your house and you are, you know, you want to save money and you want to make a roasted vegetable stock, do whatever the fuck you want. But to teach the young cook this is not good. And so I do edit this video and I said, hey, listen, you have a bright future. You're a great creator, but I disagree with this and here's why. And so I got a lot of slack from that video. A lot of people were mad and upset. And I'm like, okay, listen, if you come into my restaurant and I tell, ask you to make vegetable stock and you cut off all the ends, the dirty ends to the damn herbs and the root vegetables and it, and you make me a vegetable stock and I, you know, you're getting fired. You, I'm telling you to leave my restaurant. <clears throat> and a lot of people get the misconception of <clears throat> chef training and home cook. Do you know what I'm saying? Equally respectable, equally respectable, okay? I know some home cooks that are awesome, better than some chefs I know, and I know some chefs that cannot cook at home, okay? <laughs> so, and I'll leave it with that. No, that's, it's, it's great insight, and, and I, I just want to, as, so, as someone who also has a massive desire to kind of like help the next generation, I'm always trying to figure out like, where are the snags? Like, where, where do we, where, where do we, you know, as people who have experience, give a piece of advice and the question like, and then you get like, you give a test or like, there's still a question. It's like, I still don't get it. I still don't get it. I still don't get it. And it's like people like you and I doing the work to kind of like get down to the root of it and just being like, usually all that happens to need is a source of like a reason. So like you need to identify like for your example with the, with the pickled red onions, it's like, because I think the texture is superior. And it's like, you just need to ask why enough times to get to this root. And I think people get in this, imagine if we did this with music. So like, oh. imagine if like Lizzo posted a song and then all of a sudden people in the comments are like, Beyonce is better. And it's like, what? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it, it, draw that parallel and it makes zero sense. Why? It's like, yeah. this is Lizzo's song. Like this is Lizzo and this is how she created the song and whatever. And it's like. Beyonce is is also her own person, you know? Like, yeah, you know what? I That's a great if, point. If, if chefs did the same, like if people did the same thing with, you know, like you go on TikTok and you make a burger and someone will come in your comments and be like, Gordon Ramsay's burger is better. Maybe steak's a better example in this in this scenario. Like Gordon Ramsay's steak is better. It's like, okay, like this yeah. is my steak though. I just think it's so funny how we, we will, like if we apply those rules with music, it just makes no sense. Nobody does that. Yeah, yeah, but that, that's a good analogy, though. It's actually perfect. Mm. Uh, so I want to I want to give the floor to you for a second to talk a little bit about how chefs can take these learnings with social media, the opportunities and 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 leverage that it offers to not just get a little bit of get get some followers or potentially build an audience, but to actually make it a part of their business model. Sure. So um, for all my upcoming chefs out there, I would definitely recommend, even if you're working for somebody else, if you're an executive chef somewhere, chef de cuisine somewhere, start building your own personal brand, okay? This was frowned upon, okay? When I was working for Wolfgang Puck, I had one of the corporate chefs say, you can't build your own brand while you're piggybacking off Wolfgang's brand. And at first I was like, okay, chef, no problem. I shut down my YouTube video, right? My YouTube content. But 
Now, seeing it from the other side, I totally disagree with that. And matter of fact, I asked WP himself, chef, how come you don't invest in your other chefs to open restaurants? You know, why, why not? Like, what's the, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I think this is becoming more prevalent. So just to give you a little context here, once I became an executive chef and I started, was managing the p and I could not wrap my head around how much money the restaurant was making and what I was being held accountable for. And then my shit ass salary. <laughs> And so anyway, off that topic, if you are in a restaurant, if you're a chef, start creating your own personal brand. Okay. Trust me. Trust me when I tell you post on social media, but arguably you can negotiate with vendors to use product for the restaurant that you can highlight on social media to get them bigger deals. Here's a good example. I had a, <clears throat> I was about to do a brand deal with a salmon company who, um, you know, I definitely leveraged was like, Hey, I'll use this product, I'll use your product. You know, if you send me X amount each week, I think a lot of chefs and restaurants aren't taking advantage of this with their vendors. Even I'm sure if, you know, and I don't, I'm just using Cisco as I don't like Cisco, but I'm using them as an example. If you were to say, Hey, listen, I'll, I'll post you on social media and you have 50 K followers. You know, if you give me a discount, right, you're saving money on your food cost, right? And people don't look at this. I would definitely be looking into this right now. Like, Straight up, like if it was regalis, you know, food, I'd be like, hey man, check it out. Can you send me this and I'll post it on social, right? That way you're not stuck with that cost. It can be at his cost, but you could also raise the check average because I'm telling you right now, it's all about that top line revenue. It's all about increasing the revenue, right? Like this is really important when you're managing a restaurant or managing operation and social media is free advertising, Okay. And the thing is, is I never even took in consideration if I were to say, hey, okay, I'll use all clad. How about I, you know, I highlight I'm using this in your video and you cut me a deal instead of, you know, using my capital expenses budget to freaking purchase 20 grand worth of pans. Let's work a deal. Chefs need to start paying way more attention to that. You know, another good example is like Alto Sham. I would argue I wouldn't even think about opening a restaurant without an Alto Sham or I'm sorry, a combi oven. You, yep. No way. Just with the, with, yeah, a rationale or the, I like the Alto Shram better because it's yeah, yeah. direct steam. The, um, the rationale is a boiler steamer. But, um, anyway, what I'm saying is, is like the amount of real estate that a combi oven takes and what it can do for you compared to a regular oven. But guess what? All these restaurant owners, like, no, I'd rather spend $10,000 on a really good range. I don't want to spend 50K on a, but if you work with rationale to say, hey, we're opening this restaurant, how about I highlight this in a video or make a YouTube series about it or an instructional video, because this is, has, my, has been my experience, you know, and just let me use this as a demo, right? You can have anybody, any chef come by and I can give them a demo on it. That way, look, you're saving 50K. This can happen. I've done it, right? Like, and, and it's all because of social media leverage. And I think this is really important. I think the... Also, the, the concurrent interesting point with this is that there's a window now, and I mentioned the kind of like the bottomless hole that is con content fulfillment on any of these platforms. But simultaneously, yeah. a little bit to what we were kind of talking about with the mics off is that like Facebook just changed a lot of it. Like Facebook is in a is, is in a dark place, so that a lot of the tracking that can happen with their ads on. Uh, iPhone specifically makes it really hard for people to run ads on Facebook now. So now yeah. all these companies have these marketing budgets where they're like, well, shit, we can't spend it on Facebook ads. They're looking to other avenues like direct influencer partnerships. And they're yep. like, hey, we have this marketing spend. We want to reach the audience that you're kind of going after. So are you interested? Would you be? And if, and if you're one of the, I don't exactly know what the, the numbers are, but the proportion of people on different platforms that publish versus just consume is staggering. It is like, le I, I'm almost positive on Instagram. It's less than, maybe it's TikTok is like less than 4% of users mm -hmm. on TikTok, like post versus just consume. Yes. Fascinating numbers there. And you have to realize that just by posting, deciding that you want to grow, deciding that you want to invest in creating content, you are in the whatever, you're in the minority, you're in the high, the top percent of the Yeah, look, I'll, I'll be honest, you know what, let me just use this as an example, because look at, um, look at Chef Jenner in um, Chicago, he just made a yep. quenelle spoon, right? Mm -hmm. And massive. I'm, t yes, it is massive. And I'm curious to see what the sales are, I think, and I'm not speaking for him at all. But if he would have done a little bit of job of my of of um, 
if he would have been done a little bit better of a job marketing this thing, meaning taking – Yeah, exactly. So reach out to five chefs. Hey, post this on social media. You know what I'm saying? Hey, you know, like guaranteed if I were to post that Quinell Spoon on TikTok, like saying, hey, all you young chefs, you need this, I, it, for sure it would sell. I literally I literally have only sold one thing on TikTok and it sold out like that, dude. And it was just absolutely crazy. And um, I'm yet – but see, this is the thing. I want to be – the person that makes the product, right? Like I want to, right, you know what right. I mean? But we'll, we'll get there. But that was a great, that's a great point. And I want to make one, I want to make one suggestion for all influencers. Trust me when I tell you, stop doing brand deals in exchange for free product. Okay. Stop it. Stop. Say it louder. <laughs> we, dude, stop. Like, I know it's cool to get this shirt for free and this for free. Stop it. They need to send you the product anyway to shoot the video. <clears throat> but I think this is the biggest misconception. I don't even open these emails anymore. But what I will say is that times are changing and um, the marketing budgets are getting bigger. And I will also say one more thing. If you want the big sponsorship deals like I'm going for, like Breville, William Sonoma, um, you know, I'm saving the tank for these, like Granda, for example. Make sure your content is clean. Make sure it's you're putting on a good face. I know that a lot of people get stuck in the place where they want to make a viral video, so they do some crazy stuff like being aggressive with like you know cursing or like a good example is like the one guy on uh, TikTok. Um, there, well, there's a few of them, but he you know he cooks in his apron naked and like you know he just like this is not a good idea if you want sponsorship deals now. The sponsorship deals that are out there, I'm telling you, the bar is getting higher and higher and the bag is getting higher and higher. Literally. I one of look, one of my content creator friends, he has less followers than me. He just signed a deal with the sponsor for 75k for the year for, you know, somewhere around 15 to 18 TikTok videos. And this is real. This is a real right. deal that went through and I'm just like, okay, this is a definitely awesome, right? I'm shoot so it's really important i think yeah yeah and i i appreciate you talking about some numbers there because i think that this is something and i'm sure you can attest to this where there's it's kind yeah. of made up like it's like it, yeah. it's constantly changing like what 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 cpm was years ago is not the same what cpm is now again you're yes. we're, we're you and i are both acknowledging that like hey the marketing budget has changed because the variables have changed. We can't have a multi-pronged strategy where we're doing Facebook ads and influencer partnerships and email. Like yeah. now we have a bunch of this money that needs to get distributed elsewhere. It's like, we need yes. higher impact. So why not negotiate in a way where you can yeah. kind of like so also I'll, take I'll, advantage of that? Yeah. I'll also give another pro tip. And I think this is really important. If you're new and Please. you're, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how many followers you have. Okay. I think this is really important. A lot of people think, oh, I need to have X amount of followers to do a brand deal. No, you don't. No, you do not. What you need to do is do the legwork and reach out to these brands. They're not going to reach out to you unless you have a like. Obviously, I have brands reach out to me, but you need to read. You need to do the legwork. Also, highly recommend make sure you have a media package and a link to all of your sponsored videos so they can review, so they can see. Because you have to sell yourself, and a lot of people just think it's going to fall in their lap. No, it's not. I know people that have millions of followers that are definitely hitting the ground running, um, you know, and and um, you know, sending their media package is what it's called. And basically it's a little snapshot of you, the value you bring, your follower account, and engagement is what they look for. Engagement is the top, the top of the line. So here's a good example. On TikTok, we know that you could have 5 million followers and only get 10K views on your damn videos, right? That's why I'm in a unique spot where I only have a half a million, but my engagement is damn near 12%. And it's amazing. That's why I get scared when I get a viral video because you get followers, you get a bunch of followers, but they're not invested in you as a creator. And this is a big issue. So if you post a viral video that gets six, eight million views, and then you just get a huge amount of followers, sometimes this hurts you. Not to say, okay, it gives you good exposure, but you need to do the best you can to retain the people that have followed you. Remember that. Build a community. Don't go for the viral videos. When you think about, and this is kind of my last question before we do some rapid fires, because I, I know you okay. you had to go soon, but is there, when you think about Chef Authorized or maybe even just yourself, like, is there a long-term goal that you're kind of like pushing for? Do you just want to kind of like continue to build this? And you've mentioned this in, I think, in, in other content of yours where it's like, the, the content is is working on you as much as you're working on the content. Like you're finding a lot of fulfillment in this. So I guess when you think long-term, does anything kind of like come to mind or are you just continuing to take it day by day, week by week? 
Yeah, you know what? I'll be honest. My goals, and this is really important for all chefs, have have changed throughout my career, right? And I'll and I'll I'll make this short and sweet. It's just like when somebody asks me what my favorite cookbook is. Bitch, I don't fucking know. Okay, sorry, sorry to be blunt, but guess what? The cookbook that I was in love with ten years ago is not the same one that was eight years ago, or six years ago, or five years ago, or now. If I had to pick an overall cookbook, it'd be Modernist Cuisine. But is that good for the beginner cook? It's the same thing with my goals. My goals are not in Sharpie. And right now, currently, it's crazy because I'm so ambitious, right? I'm just so like, dude, the creativity is brewing. It's like, I want to do so many things, man. Like, it's crazy. I have my hand in real estate. I have my hand in Bitcoin. I have my hand in this. Um, You know what I'm saying? Like, it's crazy to me how many things I want to do. But ultimate goal here is, of course, I want a restaurant, right? Now, what type of rest? Okay, so I have a so I'm in half and half with my brother. We have um, we had a cloud kitchen, but now it's like a meal prep business over in Philly, yep. and he's total operations. He's also a chef, but um, for me, I'm smart enough to know that I'm not just going to go ahead and open a three Michelin star restaurant. Right? It's just not smart. But what I do want to do is I love doing pop ups. I was doing pop ups in Los Angeles, and ultimately, what I want to do is I want to have a restaurant that's super fine dining, but it's not for profit. I want to have smaller business to support this dream. Right? Because we all know that when you're at, you know, a good example is like a high-end restaurant. Like, dude, if it's a business, it has to make money. Like, and totally. sometimes that that takes away from the chef's creativity. It takes away from, you know, you know how long you can have the cooks there. And um, ultimately, I'm looking for an angel investor <laughs> that doesn't that just wants to give me the money and you know let me do my thing. But ultimately, I'm playing the long game of content creation, still being a working chef. And um, really leveraging my time uh, properly to be able to do what I want in about five to 10 years, right? Like, I want to be able to do whatever I want, like financially be set and kind of like make moves from there. But yeah, it's constantly changing. Obviously, any chef, all chefs want their own restaurant. It's just I am smart enough to know that it's not a really good idea unless you have an investor with deep pockets because I've seen so many restaurants and so many of my chef friends where they open a restaurant, they get into partnership with an investor and basically like the investor's like, where's all the money going? Right. And it's just, it is what it is. If you want to cook with wood fire here in California, which is my fucking passion, you need to spend a quarter of a million dollars on a PCU unit for your restaurant. Quarter of a million dollars, my guy, if you want to burn a piece of log in there, right? Like people don't know this. It's very difficult to ask an investor right? They want to put up 3 million and have, you know, have their friends come and have dinner. And I've had plenty of chances with the tech industry here in Silicon Valley, but like, I'm weary because I'm like, listen, you're a tech investor. I get it. Tech is like, they make millions in profit, like with the snap of a button and it's just not a good fit. And, uh, yeah, I'll end with that. I don't want to go on too long. (laughs) Well, no, I, 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 I'd be curious if you have done any digging or kind of like had a conversation maybe with, um, Andrew of Binging with Babish. I don't know if you've seen that he's opening a brick and mortar concept, and I don't know if it has any sort of investment behind it. But you know, maybe you won't need an investor. Like I can only imagine yeah. that the the revenue that he's bringing in between the content and the cookware line and whatever other revenue streams he has makes it yeah. possible for him to bootstrap a bed and breakfast style business that has four walls and is definitely going to have some food integrated into it. But yeah. it's not necessarily something where he had to go find a VC to make it happen. He's just having these other revenue streams because it's going to, it's going to ecosystem itself, right? People are going to, the super fans are going to go to the bed and breakfast, have an amazing experience and they're going to, you know, be buy the cookware for whatever the rest of their lives. Yeah. And so, so um, you, you make a, yeah. you make a really valid point And I want to touch on that because mm-hmm. see, here's the thing. He's unique, right? He has a lot like, totally. you know, you know, you know, you know, the bag he's getting just like Joshua Wiseman. Like if Joshua yeah. Wiseman were to open a yeah. restaurant right now, if he were to open a restaurant right now, he wouldn't. It wouldn't. It wouldn't crush him. Yeah, it, it wouldn't crush his life, right? Yep. Like he, yep. like if the restaurant were to fail and he were to lose some money, it wouldn't crush his life. A lot of us don't have the luxury. Listen, it took him a long time to get. It didn't like. It's not like it happened overnight, right? Yeah. Like, but the thing is, is like yes. But see, for me, if I was making that much revenue, I would do more of investing properly. So I've run restaurants before. I've worked in hotels before, and I know one thing: if you don't have a big net worth. Wolfgang Puck himself, okay, he's a millionaire, okay, he's he told me don't put up your own money. What people don't understand is these billionaires, okay, they don't give a fuck about two, three, four million dollars, okay? They don't care. It's like it's like a couple G's to us, you know? So 
to put your I wouldn't be willing to put four or five million if let's say I had even if I had fifty million in the bank, I don't know if I would be willing to put that into a restaurant necessarily. I would be able I would be willing to leverage my talent at like an artist, you know, to open a restaurant that I'm in partnership with because I feel like you can get the same result. So again, I don't know Babbage's deal, but if I were to look at it, I would eat it apart. Like I would literally pick things apart. Like for sure, I've had two offers for restaurants, right? Two really solid, good offers. And the thing is, is like I backed out once in LA and twice here in San Francisco. And the thing is, is like, yes, I can do it. But like the what people don't realize is they get excited about this concept and they want to do it. But like, bro, do you know what San Francisco is like right now? Do you know what it's like? Do you know what it's like trying to find a fucking prep cook, a goddamn dishwasher? Yep. Do you know, like you're looking at them right here. Yep. But anyway, I'll digress. Like, no. I think what people need to realize is you're just an employee of the person putting up the money. That's usually what the contract states. Like they have lawyers that make these contracts freaking crystal clear. And that's the reason why I backed out of the deal in Los Angeles because I worked at Hotel Bel Air and I'll, and I'll close with this. I was working at Hotel Bel Air. I cooked for this guy and he's like, hey, if you ever want to open a restaurant, it'd be your restaurant. You'd be the chef owner. I'd be happy to put up the money. You cook so good. You're wasting time here. And I'm like, okay. And then guess what? I was like, I text him. He's like, all right, let's do it. Let's do it right away. Let's not wait. I know this spot downtown, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? Thankfully, I have an entertainment lawyer that's in my wheelhouse, right? And I sent him, I sent him the contract. I sent him, well, the agreement kind of. And he's like, uh, do you, did you read it at all? Did you read it? And I'm like, no, he's like, you do realize this is not here. He's like, he's like, you do realize this is not your restaurant. Like Uh it's not people say whatever they want, but ultimately I would just be an employee of him. So if he wanted to come in and say, Hey, this is the concept I want to do this. I want to run breakfast now. Like you would be obligated to do that. And also you don't get any piece of the pie. You just get your base salary. There's no partnership here. You're just an employee a W2 employee. And so I think that's really important because see, I got so excited and then reality struck and uh, I'm brought back down to reality. And uh, I think this is well, what a lot of people need to take in consideration. That's so funny. We can clearly yeah. go for another uh, hour, but I'm going to quickly yeah. transition yeah. to some rapid fire questions and I'll let you yeah, go, on, go get on with it. Um, we'll do an episode two for sure. Yeah, 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 definitely. When, I call this the kind of, um, you know, it's, we'll call it like a Saturday morning and you, you kind of lumber into the kitchen and you're making eggs for yourself. How do you make those eggs? Oh, definitely. You know what? And I know this sounds kind of stupid, but I, oh, I eat two over easy eggs every single day. Like, love it. but here's the thing. I really like soft scrambled, you know, and I made, I made a soft scrambled egg on TikTok. It was crazy. Video has over hundred K views and like, People are like, oh my God, that's raw, that's this. And I'm like, no, these are perfect. In my eyes, these are perfect. But it's definitely two over easy eggs. I eat that every morning. What's a book that's been particularly impactful in your career? Definitely The Modernist Cuisine. I know I brought that up, but Modernist Cuisine pretty much changed the game for me. And then also, I will be honest and say the Roca Brothers sous vide book changed my life for sous vide cooking. I got a tattooed right here, sous vide. I remember it. But 2000, 2009, I remember when that when uh, I was getting into sous vide cooking, and I got the old circulator too, the one from PolyScience, the gray one. Yep. I remember I spent my whole paycheck on that freaking circulator. It was like eleven hundred bucks. For modernist cuisine, was it the way that they laid out the recipes? Was it the history that they talked about, like really getting to the why of some things? Like what did it do? What did modernist cuisine do for you? It made me think deeply of what type of chef I wanted to be. It made me also really taking consideration that sometimes it's not chefs aren't always right and science and data is in fact correct and huge Huge. you know it it is and it's like i did some of these recipes and like i think sometimes as chefs when um, like a good example is i can pull a recipe off the internet and like if it's if it's messed up i'll know and i can fix it a lot of people can't do that but in modern cuisine it's like it tells you okay this is the reason why we tested this many um, this is the best result. And I thought that was awesome. What's one thing you change your mind on in recent memory? Dude, it's like like a moving target. I change my mind all the time. And I'll be honest, the one thing that I changed my mind has nothing to do with cooking. It's cryptocurrency, investing in Bitcoin. Fascinating. You know, And it's investing in Ethereum and Bitcoin because ultimately what the goal is is – 
I want to create a community where I'm able to leverage NFTs as a community based, right? So, you know, later on down the road and everybody knows, and I don't want to like talk about it too much, but this is the future, right? The metaverse NFTs are the future. But the thing is, if I would have put a thousand dollars in Bitcoin, like I had the opportunity to in LA in 2016, 2017, God damn, I would have a hundred K like easy, but it's all good. But yeah, I've been changing my mind. So so many I'm, times I'm, st I'm stomping that rabbit hole shut because we could easily we're like teetering on yeah. the edge of diving down it and we could jam yeah. on it but we'll 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 save it we'll save it you somehow get a call right after this interview that you've just won an all expenses paid trip to eat at your dream restaurant and when you get there there's someone you've always wanted to talk with waiting to have dinner with you what is that restaurant and who is that person definitely noma I've always wanted to go to Noma. I've always went and I've always seen it. I met Renee at Alinea when, you know, he came for dinner and it was really cool. He, you know, we were smoking, he was smoking cigarettes in the back. But um, that person that I would eat dinner with would be David Chang. And I know that sounds kind of weird, but uh, oh. Chef David, I've met, I've met a couple times, but, um, you know, I always wanted to go to Noma. So I, when I grew up, Noma was like, you know, when I grew up in the industry, it was like Noma was like, you know, it was it was the creme de la creme and they got number one, still two Michelin stars. But like they were just it was just absolutely domination. All of my chef friends went to go work there. And then I always wanted to go, but I just never had the opportunity. But I will take a step back and say it, before that, it would have been Ebuli before it closed. Got it. Same. Yeah. Same. What would you what would you ask David Chang if you got to have a whole like whatever it is, two, three hour dinner at Noma with him? What would you talk to him about? Yeah. So definitely. Well, I listen to his podcast a lot, a lot of the times, but there's a lot of things that I would want to speak to him about, but just basically be only because we have, I don't want to say we have history together, but like he's from Northern Virginia. I'm from Northern Virginia. He worked at Cafe Blued. I worked at Cafe Blued. The only way I've met him is uh, via a dinner I did back in Los Angeles and also via Joshua Skeens because they went to culinary school together. But there would be so many things I'd want to talk to him about. The The, the one thing that I would definitely say and not try not to be a fanboy is because he changed the way I saw ramen noodles or ramen in Whoa. general. So before dining at Momofuku in, I don't know, was 2006, 2007, I'm not sure. Ramen noodles to me were the package. You know what I'm saying? Cheap, budget-friendly food. I had no idea what real ramen was until I went to Momofuku. And then that just opened up a huge rabbit hole for me. So the first thing would be to thank him because, yeah, I'm American, okay? I didn't know. But it really changed the game. Obviously, now I'm more well versed on ramen, and like, especially here in San Francisco and Los Angeles, I would argue that's better. But um, yeah, he opened my eyes to a couple things. I love it. One more question for you. But is there anything that we didn't potentially cover, or anything that you want to ask me, or, or any sort of asks of the audience before I uh, wrap it up here? No, but um, not not necessarily. The only thing I do want to, um... no, I, you know. No, I, actually, I think I'm good. I think yeah, we, we good. yeah, man, we crushed a lot of things. Yeah, we did. We did. And, and and the last question, you might have already brought this up already, but it's what do you think chefs can be doing better to help the next generation? Yeah, um, I would definitely say work-life balance. I'm not going to say that work-life balance is a thing in the chef world, but honestly, it's happening. Like whether you like it or not, the industry is changing. I spent so many weeks working straight through seven days a week, 14 to 16 hour days, and I think we need to do better as chefs of making sure we invest in our cooks and making sure they're healthy and they're exercising and they are, you know, not suffering from drug and alcohol addiction like me. And, you know, <laughs> like seriously, that's a, that is so important to nowadays. I think if you're going to work a 12 hour shift, four days a week, four days a week, I'll fucking die on that hill. Four days a week, four days a week. And for chefs in general, listen, the company pays you for a 40-hour work week. If you are working 70, 80 hours a week, you know, it's because of time management. You have time management issues. And I know sometimes you're understaffed, but you should be shooting for that 40 hours. Be flexible within five to eight hours of that. And obviously, if there's any emergency situations, but this working six days a week at 14 hours for some badge of honor. Listen, man, you're going to end up like me at 35 with zero. What you need to do is focus in your day on getting your work done and delegating properly so you can have a reasonable life outside of work because it just goes downhill. And I think this is something that we don't talk about as chefs and restaurant employees. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like 
it's just something we don't talk about that I think needs to be addressed. Brandon Dearden, everybody, where can people go find you? Where do you want to direct people? Because I know that you have a couple different profiles. Is there a preferred yeah. one right now or just kind of t- tell people where, where to go? If they have so questions. basically, I, I'm most I'm most active on Instagram and TikTok at Chef Authorized. But I also have a YouTube channel that I've got a good plan and strategy for that I'm going to start crushing. Brandon, we're going to definitely do a round two because we clearly didn't talk enough about crypto or uh, uh, interviewing and hiring or – uh, uh, health. I wanted to talk to you about health as well. And so like, yeah. there, there's so many topics that we didn't get to. Uh, until next time, I, I really, yes. really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks again. Yeah, man, it was a blast. I had a blast with Brandon. Uh, clearly, we could have talked for many, many more hours on so many wide-ranging topics. Please let me know either on Twitter. You can send me an email. You can tag me on Instagram or even leave a comment on YouTube if you're watching this on YouTube with what you'd like to see in potentially a part two with Brandon because it might not necessarily happen like immediately. It might not be the next episode, but for future stuff, I'd love to know based on the conversation we just had what your thoughts are. Reminder that channel partner Corin is very, very kindly making it possible for you to shop, to save, to get sharpening services, to get gear. Uh, whether you're in New York or you want to get it delivered, you can definitely check out the link in the description for Corin, and you definitely help out the content that we produce. Also, friendly reminder that the first 10 people from this episode that sign up for a demo for Yelp for restaurants are getting a $100 Visa gift card from them, which is really, really cool. And lastly, if you are looking to implement delivery at your restaurants, DoorDash has a ton of different options and they're giving away special low fee commissions right now. And so for the first three months, the first 10 people that sign up for DoorDash aren't going to pay anything to DoorDash to just get up and running and offer delivery to your customers. Until next time, thanks so much for listening to the podcast. Roll the outro. Well, well, here we are again together at the end of another episode of the Emulsion Podcast. If this was your first time listening, this is a show for chefs who want to think better, increase their performance, and believe that it's possible to take lessons from what others have learned. I am your host, Justin Kana, and if you're new here, I'd like to personally welcome you to the show. It's really, really great to have you. This is a friendly reminder to check out the show notes inside of the description of this podcast if you want to check out previous guests I've had on the show, links to specifics that may have gotten brought up in this episode, and ways to find other helpful content that I create and share online. If you're still here listening, there's a pretty good chance you're going to enjoy what I put out there because it's all focused on helping chefs and hospitality professionals perform better. If you don't have a lot of time, the best place to start is with the email newsletter that I write every single week. It's called the 8020 Edge, and there I share knowledge on sharpening your skills, asymmetric upside, that's where the 80 20 comes from and exploring the industry beyond the status quo. I say it's a great time saver because I also include all of the content in that newsletter that I publish every week, everything that I've posted on Instagram, new podcast episodes, and YouTube videos. Speaking of YouTube, you should check out the YouTube channel. There I have gear reviews of knives, spoons, pieces of equipment that I've tested, documented experiences, so going out to eat videos from some of the best restaurants in the world, and other kind of tips and tricks videos of advice that I think would be helpful for you. Lastly, if you want to learn about my intense professional development focused course, Get Coaching for me to help you make your next move or support the show financially, you can check out justincona.com slash support to learn more. And that's greatly appreciated. Last up, and I know that other podcast hosts say it too, because it really does help is to share a review of this show on Apple podcasts, because that helps the podcast universe know that people like us like shows like this. And until the next episode, I really appreciate you spending time with me today. My name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one.